Many books, films, and TV series tend to romanticize the Victorian era, peppered with magnificent clothes, magnificent houses, and fiery romance. Questions of the last bath and the general hygiene of the protagonists move somewhat into the background. However, once we peek behind all the layers of silk and lace, one thing becomes clear – the Victorians were actually pretty gross by our standards. So let's hold our noses together and listen and see what the hygiene practices of the time were really all about. But before we get started, a quick question for you. What do you think? How often did people wash their hair in the Victorian era? Write us your guesses in the comments now and find out if you were right. Also, leave us a like and a subscription if you're happy that soap and running water are accessible to all of us these days. And now, let's get started. Going to the toilet In our modern world, we enjoy many amenities that were absolute luxuries in the past. All of us probably have a functioning heating system and sanitary facilities in the house. And even if we're short on money, there is at least enough money for a bottle of shampoo. In the 19th century, many countries did not have compulsory schooling or laws dictating how a house should be furnished. Although many upper-class houses had their own bathrooms toward the end of the Victorian era, the occupants of the time had a very different concept of hygiene than we do. Before we go into more detail about the strange hygiene practices of this era, we would like to start with a very practical question. How did women actually use the toilet back then? In view of the baggy, layered dresses, one might think that using the toilet was tantamount to an elaborate procedure. So did the ladies of creation first have to laboriously peel themselves out of their clothes just to be able to relieve themselves for a moment? Luckily, it wasn't that complicated. In fact, the clothes and especially the underwear were designed to make going to the bathroom a breeze. Accordingly, the underwear was more like a kind of pants, which was loose and had a split crotch. So all the women had to do was lift their skirts and crinolines and sit on the toilet seat and, well, you can guess the rest. However, since not all families had an indoor toilet, many had no choice but to go outside and use the outhouse as soon as nature took its toll. Against the background that the toilet paper roll was only invented in 1891, another question arises. How did people clean themselves after going to the toilet? The answers may hurt a bit. They used old newspapers and sometimes even corn on the cob. Bathing the birth of the shower dates back to 1872. Although the sanitary facilities were initially used in prisons, barracks, and boarding schools, for the general public, if you want to keep yourself clean, you have to take a bath from time to time. Poorer families boiled water on the stove and poured it along with cooler water into a wooden or metal tub, usually in the kitchen. Better off households could look forward to real porcelain tubs, complete with hot and cold water taps. Some households even had the luxury of all luxury goods, a foot bath. In order to learn how to bathe properly, the Victorians could stick their noses in one of the countless accompanying books. They advised their readers to wait at least four hours before bathing after a meal. If you've ever traveled, it's best not to wash your face unless you can clean the water with alcohol or ammonia beforehand. The so-called Russian bath provided for washing the face with extremely hot and then very cold water. This would prevent the formation of wrinkles. Washing hair Victorian women's hairstyles were often very elaborately pinned up, so the ladies wore their hair like a kind of natural crown, with the principle, the more pompous and healthier, the better. However, the women did not wash their hair nearly as often as we do today, but only once a week or once a month. Many hygiene and beauty books recommended that people with an oily scalp should only wash their hair every two weeks. For everyone else, washing your hair once a month is enough. Before the first shampoos came out, people used ordinary soap, which severely dried out the scalp and hair. But sometimes, pure ammonia was also used to wash the hair. Given that, it's not surprising that oily pomades were all the rage back then. In fact, Many of the hair care products at the time could also be found in the ordinary pantry. Accordingly, women often cracked several eggs over their heads, worked the mass into their hair, and then rinsed it out with water. At the time, diluted vinegar, black tea, rosemary, and rum could also be consumed and applied externally. Those who were struggling with gray hair could stock up on Hall's Vegetable Sicilian Hair Renewer from the 1860s 
and indeed, the hair could be successfully darkened with the tincture, but unfortunately, it contained large amounts of lead, which was not exactly conducive to the health of the user. A Question of Scent at the time when terms like deodorant and body lotion were still foreign words, there weren't many ways to cover up your own body odor or musty smell of old clothes. Wealthy women resorted to perfumes, although special scented powders were significantly cheaper. Men often swore by laurel rum. The rum mixed with spices and perfume was developed by seafarers around the year 1500 to declare war on the stench. Those who could not afford such items simply tried to stay as clean as possible. Poorer women, for example, used special clothing tags to protect their clothes from underarm perspiration. However, the outer clothing was only rarely washed. It was more practical to simply brush the clothes and coats clean, which brings us to the next point. To make the laundry When it came to clean laundry, Victorians often used more than just soap. Chalk and milk were sometimes used to remove heavy soiling such as grease, oil, or bloodstains. Since urine is known to contain ammonia, the natural excretions were readily used to bleach clothing. Oral Hygiene Dentistry wasn't very advanced in the 19th century, and most of the work done by an ordinary dentist was the extraction of rotten teeth. But often, there was no dentist in the area. In this case, the local barber or blacksmith had to be consulted. To brush their teeth, many people used salt in their fingers sometimes perhaps a frayed twig. The toothbrush as we know it today was invented in 1857, but it wasn't until the introduction of nylon bristles in the 1930s that toothbrushing really became mainstream. If you couldn't afford toothpaste, you had to make it yourself. Soot, chalk, and ground squid were used, among other things. Dangerous Smells have you ever heard of the miasma theory? According to this theory, which emerged in the 19th century, bad air was not only unpleasant, it was a fire hazard. According to this, bad smells would always contain pathogens that were transmitted to humans via the respiratory tract and the skin. Before this thesis was superseded by the doctrine of infection, the Victorians even went so far as to blame the poor health of London slums on the stench in the streets. As we know today, however, it was in fact the poor sanitary and hygienic conditions that paved the way for the outbreaks of disease in the industrial areas. Tuberculosis Clothes We now know that tuberculosis is an infectious disease spread by bacteria. In the Victorian era, however, knowledge of the contagion wasn't quite as sophisticated as it is today, which is why some medical scientists have claimed that it was women's long dresses that led to the spread of the dangerous disease. The background, if long skirts were dragging across the streets outside, the pathogen would be picked up and unknowingly brought into the house. The tight corsets also allegedly posed a high risk as they compressed the lungs. It was well known that the stiff undergarments constricted the organs of their wearers and were anything but harmless. The Big Stink the fact that the London summer of 1858 went down in history as the Great Stink has an unsavory background. In fact, it was common practice at the time for the British capital's sewage and rubbish to be discharged unhindered into the Thames. However, when the thermometer climbed to around 34 degrees, there was an acrid smell that was almost unbearable. As a result of the unchecked pollution, the river also spread dangerous epidemics such as typhus and cholera. In order to somehow combat the stench, the curtains of the Palace of Westminster were soaked in chlorinated lime and MPs considered moving to another building. After the dirt in the Thames was washed away by heavy rains, the problem seemed to be solved for the time being. However, in order to prevent such incidents in the future, Parliament decided to analyze the consequences of the Great Stink and to work out permanent solutions. This was finally the hour of Joseph Bazalgette. The civil engineer had already submitted the plans for the construction of a sewage system before the stinking summer, which, however, had been repeatedly rejected. But once the sewage system was finally completed, Londoners could look forward to clean drinking water and a precipitously falling mortality rate. In fact, the sewage system designed by Bazalgette is still in operation today. Tinctures of Lead We've all heard about weird beauty hacks that actually work. 
But the same cannot be said about many of the facts we're about to cover, including this one involving lead tinctures. Nowadays, a healthy tan is considered an attractive sign of vitality. A few centuries ago, however, a tan skin was considered an unwelcome symbol of aristocratic circles which was reserved for the lower classes only. Only farmers worked constantly under the burning sun. In order to visibly distinguish themselves from the lower classes, the rich opted for an elegant pallor. However, since the sunlight could not always be shielded, special tools were sometimes required to maintain the pale complexion. From today's perspective, this means that Queen Elizabeth I of England use for this seems particularly grotesque. Accordingly, the monarch swore by a mixture of lead and vinegar to achieve a radiantly white skin to stand out from the simple peasantry. The queen's pockmarks were also successfully covered in this way, when neither Elizabeth nor any other nobles who rubbed such a tincture on their faces suspected that lead is poisonous and shouldn't be on the skin. Accordingly, numerous cases have been handed down in which people have slowly but surely been carried off by their day-to-day -day beauty routine. One of the most obvious cases in which modern science has saved countless lives. Back then, people would use lead for all sorts of things. It was a very common metal that found its way into almost every facet of life. However, we understand these days that lead is no joke and should not be used unless proper care is taken and preventative garments are worn. It certainly shouldn't be used in any beauty products. Arsenic against pimples Anyone struggling with acne in the 19th century could buy sponges containing arsenic to declare war on their pimples. While the cosmetics industry fortunately steers clear of the toxic substance today, back then it was considered a safe bet to help achieve an even complexion. And indeed, the sponges helped get rid of skin impurities, but this was because the arsenic killed the user's blood cells without further ado. The dependency that developed after prolonged use was particularly tricky. If you stopped using the product, the acne came back worse than ever. What followed was a vicious cycle in which users slowly but surely poisoned themselves in order to keep their skin clear. Arsenic is a very powerful poison that can have serious health consequences if it enters your body in large amounts. Certain fruits, such as apples or pears, have arsenic in them naturally. However, this is in a very small quantity and is virtually harmless, though rubbing such a chemical on your skin can lead to serious health consequences, not the least of which includes worsening acne that may never go away. Bedpans Does the following situation sound familiar? You've just made yourself comfortable in your cozy and warm bed and are ready to fall into a restful sleep. Then, you feel a sudden urge to use the bathroom. In such cases, we have no choice but to get out of bed, for better or worse, and go to the toilet. What is now most exclusively used in hospitals was much more popular in the past, bedpans. In those days, people could relieve themselves into the appropriate container and then slide back into the land of dreams. Not particularly appetizing, sometimes the bedpan and its contents were then pushed back under the bed. Those that wanted to get rid of their leftovers from the Middle Ages simply tipped them out the window. At that time, people were simply not aware of the germs and pathogens that were washing out onto the street, not to mention the terrible stench that this practice created around the houses. All right, folks, now it's your turn. What do you think of the unusual hygiene and beauty practices of the Victorian era? We are already looking forward to your comments. Leave us a like and subscribe to stay up to date from now on. And with that, thanks for watching, have a good one, and see you next time.